Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to have you all here and to be talking with Jason Griskoff of Submit Hub. I am excited to be talking with him because I've been using Submit Hub, gosh, I think it was 2018. I was just was looking in my account to see when I first started to take some submissions for women of substance, just to kind of add some uh, different levels of artist to our roster. We take submissions directly and we take submissions from Submit Hub and Broad Jam and all these places. But Submit Hub, I have found is such a great place to meet a lot of artists that I wouldn't have normally met. And I've been recommending it to my Rock Your Next Release students for several years now because it is is a great place to get some placements, especially when you're releasing music. So we're gonna talk about all the ways that Submit Hub can help you as an artist. But before we do that, I would love to hear from you, Jason, like how did you, what made you start Submit Hub? How did it get off the ground? And what was your idea for starting it? Okay. The year was 2015. Actually, rewinding even further, I started a music blog in 2008 and it was called Indie Shuffle. It's still around. So we've been running for about 14 years now. And what I did every day was find new songs and share them on the internet. And this actually predates obviously Spotify, but it even predated SoundCloud. And for a while, music blogs, including Indie Shuffle, were the it the it crowd. We were the ones who could make or break an artist. And many of the acts that were headlining festivals like Coachella and Bonnaroo and Lollapalooza were all discovered through this collective energy of music blogs. And um, one website in particular called Hype Machine, which did a really good job of trying to, they called it aggregate, all of the content that music blogs throughout the world were covering and then synthesizing that into a chart so that people who did A&R or book shows could go onto the hype machine and see these are the most blogged artists this week um, or this month or this year. And through that, a lot of names that you are probably quite familiar with today across many genres, Lana Del Rey, Chance the Rapper, Lord, Passion Pit, it's just the list goes on and on um all these bands from 2005 to 2015 that really made a name through music blogging and one of the cool things about that was being a music blogger even if you were small or you know all the way up to pitchfork you had some credibility and and people wanted your attention Mm. so that came with some perks like free shows um, I, we went to South by Southwest a lot of, a, a lot of years. We'd, we'd get press passes to Coachella, Bonnaroo, a lot of, like all these music festivals would give us passes for free. You know, people are spending $300 on a ticket and they'd be like, oh no, we want Indie Shuffle here. How many of you are coming? Do you need a photographer? Mm. Send us the articles you're going to write. So it was cool being a music blog. There were a lot of perks. But one of the downsides, of course, was that as this popularity grew, artists and of course, publicists and record labels became aware that the way in was to get as many music blogs as you could to write about your content. So that meant that as a music blogger, you would open up your inbox in the morning and you probably had 100, 200, sometimes 300 emails oh, untargeted. So, you know, originally it was a lot of very targeted emails. Hey, I love your blog. You know, we sound similar to this band that you've been covering and do this. But but after time, as an artist, you, there were all these businesses selling spreadsheets. Here's a, an email list of 2,000 music bloggers. And so people would just copy, paste, put them all in the BCC, send it out and hope for the best, right? So we would get, you know, death metal songs and Afro house and hip or whatever, the stuff that we didn't typically cover. And it also wouldn't be genuinely targeted towards us. Oh, I'm familiar Some with that because uh, on a, yeah. having a female-based first radio station and then podcast, I would get all these mail artists. I'm like, 
do you pay attention to the, even the name of us? You know, you no, you don't. You're just sending out yeah. to everyone. And, and you can't blame them, right? It, it, it was a daunting thing. And, and a lot of these guys, they, you know, you're a musician, you make music. That you've, you've gone through so much to get to where you are. You've learned how to play instruments. You've learned how to record it. You've learned how to mix it. You've learned how to actually you maybe even made a CD or a vinyl or a T-shirt or you're playing live. And oh, by the way, you have to market as well. <laughs> so you go look into hiring a publicist, but that's $2,000 for a month. So you go, okay, screw it. $20 spreadsheet. Boom. Hey, everyone, here's my MP3 file, or here's my link to Google Drive, or here's a SoundCloud, here's a Spotify, whatever. And as a music blogger, you just got this constant barrage and you couldn't tell what was genuine, what wasn't genuine. I gave up. I totally gave up. I made a submissions at IndieShuffle.com and I just funneled every email there and we never looked at it. And so you had this weird patch from 2012 to 2015 where most music blogs were in a similar situation. They were overwhelmed by submissions and so they started to ignore them. And then we all just started regurgitating the same content. And a lot of the same artists were getting covered and there was actually very little new music discovery, especially from the hype machine blogs. There were tons of little blogs out there still doing it. But for those of us who had some name behind us and who had gotten into these spreadsheets, we suddenly just started regurgitating the same stuff and um, we lost track of, of the little artists. So lots of things were going on on the side. You had sort of the, the demise of SoundCloud, the rise of Spotify and Apple Music coming out and all of these things. You had Google pushing music blogs and actual content down in favor of YouTube videos. And you also had advertising in the digital space fall apart. So most music blogs, by the time 2015 had come around, were starting to lose visitors to services like Spotify. They weren't getting the search traffic that they used to get because if anyone searched for a song on Google, headline was a giant YouTube image, mm. and they weren't making much money anymore. And so a lot of music blogs actually just started giving up or they had to go. And I know one that was really popular called The Music Ninja, and at one point he just had to he had quit everything he was doing to take his music blog full time and it worked for a couple of years and then he had to pack it in and go back to work. So, and, and that wasn't an unusual situation. And we were all very lucky, I suppose, to have had uh, an opportunity to, to even dabble with the idea of being a full time music blogger. Anyway, that is the context and history that leads up to the creation of Submit Hub because in 2015, I found myself, uh, I had quit my job, my day job at Google in 2013. I was working at Google, which was a mm. pretty cushy job. And in 2013, I quit to become a full-time blogger. Uh, and so by the time 2015 had rolled around, things weren't working out as well. And I was faced with the choice of either trying something else or going back to Google and begging for a job. And so I did a lot of freelancing where I was building websites for actually other music blogs. Um, I, I knew how to code these players, a universe, like Indie Shuffle's got one where you hit play and then you can navigate around the site and it doesn't stop, mm. which might sound like no duh <laughs> to people these days, but Indie Shuffle was actually one of the, we were the second music website to have this. The first one was Hype Machine. We had, uh, SoundCloud didn't get it until 2012, the ability to navigate the website while the music still plays. It was, it was a pretty crazy internet thing to do. That's fun. And I knew how to do it. So people would hire me to do that. And I didn't enjoy coding for other people. I don't think many coding freelancers do, but I did learn a heck of a lot in that process. So I'm, I'm a self-taught coder. And that, that year or so of freelancing for people, switching from my website and actually trying to make it for others, um, leveled my game up quite a lot. Mm. And in 2015, I decided, okay, here, let's do this one last chance. I'm going to try to solve this problem Indie Shuffle has with the 300 submissions a day. And I'm gonna try and create a simple website where people just fill in artist name, song title, put in the link, and I'm gonna use my magic code so that no matter what type of link they use, whether it's SoundCloud or YouTube or an MP3 or Spotify, it all comes into my feed the same way. So I was That's solving this problem That's how that works, of, okay. I wondered yeah. how you could bring in those all those different feeds. Magic. <laughs> So it all comes together in just a really nice, consistent, well-organized feed that looks a lot like your SoundCloud stream might. 
But what's happening on the back end is it's, you know, artists can choose their, their preferred methods of, of submission. So as a blogger, it suddenly became really easy to start sifting through your submissions. If you liked it, you did a thumb up. And if you didn't like it, you did a thumb down. And then the person who sent you the song got notified. And within a couple months, I had signed up about 10 other music blogs who I had sort of networked with and made friends with over the years. And they had all had the similar situation and so needed something like this. And very quickly, we had artists saying, hey, you gave me a thumb down. Why? Can't you tell me? And I said, OK, I'll tell you for a dollar. And the rest is history. So the, the idea really took off. In some circles, it's still quite controversial. There are a lot of people who don't like the idea that you are paying music to be considered for feature. Well, you're not in those circles here because I've been a curator since 2007 and I understand the time consumption that it takes to go through music. Yeah, but I mean, my counter example, which I've heard before is, uh, do you know how much time it takes to make music? Yes. Why should you get paid and the artists don't? And the reality is a supply and demand thing. There's, there's an oversaturation of music and a limited number of curators. And so when you're opening up your inbox and you've got 200 submissions, what are you going to do? So yeah, that's how Submit Hub got started. Yeah, I mean... As a curator, like, you know, we have marketing costs, we have website costs, we have all of that stuff. And mm. as I said, like we have time and I get where the artists are coming from. I'm an artist, you know, and I always tell artists this, but like, if you want these, these curated places to continue to exist, you have to support them in some way because they are also a business. So I definitely need to throw that in because I yeah, I'm sure you do get those, you know, haters who are like, how can you charge for this? You know, I get them as well. But as you said, musicians, they need to be realistic and realize that there is, it is a supply and demand kind of thing. And if you're wanting to be in a place that's really well curated, instead of just like a dumping ground for everyone, then you do have to, you know, you have to invest a little bit. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> I feel for <laughs> artists, right? I mean, every, every, corner you turn you have to buy your instruments you have to buy recording software you have to do and and then and then finally it all gets done and you realize there were sixty thousand other songs released that day on spotify mm -hmm. and it can be a bit deflating but i i think you're right without independent curators all you're left with is the big corporate guys to decide who makes it and who doesn't and increasingly it's going that direction regardless of whether these indies exist spotify is a great example where Four years ago, they championed independent playlisters and they would feature them on their homepage. And that Spotify only had about 10 or 20 editorial playlists. Today, they've got thousands. They pop them up nonstop to fill any search term that they see is catching on. Um, they've even made one for Indie Shuffle to try and overtake our playlists because they noticed that Indie Shuffle's playlists were getting some traction. So sure, let's go ahead. We'll just call our playlist Indie Shuffle. Boom, we're number one in the search results for this. And so you, you even find that independent playlisters on Spotify have to essentially run their own advertising in order to keep their playlists engaged. And yeah, I mean, everything's kind of going the way of the, the corporate behemoths. So it's important to, in many ways, keep these independent voices alive, whoever they are, which is something we're conscious of and hopefully we can help contribute towards, but it's tough. It's tough. Yeah, it is. So you guys, you started out with mostly bloggers, you know, so how did that evolve? Cause I know now you've got like people that are Instagram influencers that are doing shout outs and, you know, TikTok and all kinds of stuff. How did that kind of evolve between when you first started and now, you know, I'm a podcaster, so there's podcasters, there's all kinds of different influencers on the platform. I remember in my mid twenties reading articles floating around on, on Rolling Stone or somewhere that said that you stop discovering your music in your 30s mm. and you start to fall back to your favorites. And very few people continue to discover actively beyond their 30s. Curators, I'm sure, are a slightly different crowd here. Um, I won't assume your age. I'll, you might be approaching your 30s, it looks like. But um... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're so kind. No, I'm almost 50. <laughs> I, and I definitely um, get that. I'm very much like, yes, 80s music. That's when I grew up. But I am also, I have to be as you said, like you have to be proactive in discovering new yeah. because you will easily fall back on the things that bring up memories for your, your life. 
But but the average Joe is not going to be with music, right? They might mm -hmm. be proactive in whatever other hobby they have, building cars, watching Netflix, I don't know, whatever someone's hobby is. But um, with that realization comes an awareness that you know, music blogs are losing their traction. They had an older audience. There's a different group that grew up, so to speak, with music blogs. So mm -hmm. I started to think about where people discover the most music in their lives. And it's definitely the late teens and early 20s. It's a time where you are trying to establish your own identity, figure out who you are. And music is a really important part of that. And so often when you start to see, or at least when I was growing up, this, you got the emo kids and the hardcore kids and the punk kids and all you know, it, the early 20s are a time of, of discovering yourself and expressing yourself and music discovery is an essential part of that. And so I've found it important to keep a, an eye on where that demographic is discovering music. As long as we can keep doing that, I think we can stay relevant. So if Submit Hub today was still just about music blogs, I think you'd have a lot of people questioning the relevancy of that. So what that meant was it, by the time 2017 rolled around, we started to feature Spotify playlisters. And I know it doesn't seem like that long ago, but that's five years ago and Spotify playlisting was not actually that big of a deal. And now Spotify playlisting is where it is in many artists' minds, but I actually, I think, I think that one's an uphill battle. We can, we can chat about it more, but uh, it goes without saying that today, that younger demographic from 18 to 25 are engaging with music on TikTok and Instagram. Whether they're actually falling in love with and continuing to listen to that music is hard to say, but that's where they engage with it, right? You create an Instagram story or a reel or a TikTok video and you got to attach a song. Mm -hmm. And so for many of these artists, they're consuming things and I mean, music, the users, people, they're consuming music in small sound bites, but they are still using it and discovering it. So over the last, gosh, it's been two years now, we've been putting a ton of effort into the influencer side of submissions to try and create something valuable for artists because you're not going to go viral. So what will you get out of it? And that's been our big struggle. Uh, I think we're at a good place now, but that is to answer your question, the thought process that goes into how we shape where artists can be featured on Submit Hub. Mm. Well, yeah, it makes a lot of sense for sure. And it's smart to, to kind of watch the, the trends of Gen Z and what they're doing. I do wonder though, like what about the kinds of, I mean, I'm not saying that Gen Z doesn't like certain genres, but you know, there are certain genres that maybe aren't going to stand out for them, say adult contemporary, or I don't know, maybe bluegrass or something like that. That's a little bit yeah. older classic genre. Rock. Yeah, classical, things yeah. like that. I, I mean, absolutely. So so I think what you're finding as Submit Hub gets older, um, it's over six years old now, but the, there's a broader and broader spectrum of influence, of curators, influencers, labels on there to, to cover all of these niches. Um, I mean, now we even have things like flamenco and salsa. Those are genres on Submit Up. But we started out with five genres and I think now we're at about 160. It's a so lot. It, I just went in there. I haven't yeah. been in Submit Hub for a while and I went in there and it was like, oh, see these new like 35 genres that you can choose yeah. from. And I was like, oh my gosh. And they're yeah. super Sorry. specific. It's getting more and more granular as time goes on. And, and I think it's, by the end of this year, it's going to be even more granular in terms of uh, how much choice artists have and how well they can target. So we'll see. Yeah, that's very uh, probably the most genres that I've seen of any kind of curator platform like this. And, and, and yet I'm, I'm a, a, we a, often get complaints that our genres are too limited. <laughs> that's funny. It's, I mean, I, there's, there's what's it called? Everynoise.com. I don't know if you've seen that website. I've heard of it. It's an incredible website. It, it is now owned by Spotify, but it has every noise on it. They they basically have every single genre that exists, and it's in this it's in this crazy spider web pattern. So you can see all the links between it, and you can click on any genre and listen to that sound. So if anyone is with us right now, everynoise.com is it's gonna it's a trip. It'll take up ten minutes of your time at least. Mm. Just going through it and be like, wow, what is Thai funk? That's incredible. Or 
New Zealand 80s punk. All right, sure, New Zealand 80s punk. All right. So it, it's got every noise on there and, and <laughs> it's incredible. So at 160 genres, we've got, we've got plenty of room to expand. Yeah, yeah, that that sounds like a really cool site to like, especially if you're not sure like how to categorize yourself as a genre. <laughs> Although it sounds like you could just go down a rabbit hole with that. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll have people asking us, why don't you have New Zealand 80s punk? Right. Uh, and by the way, it's retro New Zealand 80s punk. So oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> so one thing I've noticed about Submit Hub is that you guys have a really great like system to make sure that curators are really sharing what they say they're going to share, that they're getting all the information that they need, that the copyright's all being covered. Did that develop over time? And, you know, like what, what have you found is, is the most important that curators and artists need to like share with this relationship they're developing? It's pretty smooth now, to be honest. Um, it has developed over time. So Copyrights, for example, I remember spending weeks coding that the, the PDF generation was a nightmare. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure I'd find it easy now, though. I've got so much more coding behind me. But um, it evolved over time to meet the needs of the people who are on there. So when I originally built Submit Hub, it was for me. And what would happen is that when someone approved something, for example, that was it. That was the end of the story. It was approved. And we didn't get involved with what happens next. But increasingly, we found that as people were spending money on the website, they would come to us and say, hey, why is my song not shared yet? Um, and we, we had one particularly bad case early on where I remember a guy approving 300 songs in a row, cashing out all the money and then disappearing. And I thought, oh, crap, that's, that sucks. What a poopy pants. But, but ultimately my fault, right? So at that point, I had to code this two-step system where you, you find a song you like, you approve it, and then you still have to go the next step of marking it as shared when it's actually being shared. So things like that evolve over time. The copyright one was when we started signing up YouTube channels. They need copyright approvals to upload songs to YouTube so that they don't get strikes. Cool. So I had to code that. Things like Spotify. If you're a playlister and you find a song that you like, you can actually add it to Spotify directly through Submit Hub. So again, it's, it's about finding that convenience creating it for the users and going from there. Um, on the influencer side, it's, it's similar, right? We, we signed up a bunch of influencers and then we had issues with them sharing content that didn't have the right song attached or didn't have a song attached at all, or was only three seconds long, or was from a different account, or was published five years ago. And so over time, you have to learn all these ways that people try to essentially cheat the system uh, and, and build safeguards into it. And luckily everything, almost everything can be done with code. So there are ways to check this, uh, on the influencer side, I can do all of that. Like how long is the share? I can check the duration before you actually get your credit for it. It is in some ways quite reactionary. Um, I'm still very involved on a day-to-day -day business, uh, in the chat rooms that we have. So the chat rooms were created because it makes communication a lot easier when your song gets approved, you have a chat open directly between a curator and the whole idea of Submit Hub was that there'd be no emails. And I thought, okay, well, we've got one-on-one -on -one chat, so let's just have a chat room. So now there's a blogger's chat room and an artist chat room. Um, and I'm able to use those to actually connect with people and figure out where their pain points are or the opportunities for improvement would be. So it's a constant, somewhat reactionary process of, of building this product out. And of course I have ideas of the direction it's going and I'm building those things. Um, I do a lot of, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard the phrase launch and iterate. So a lot of startups try to make the, the their first product perfect and they try to think of everything and they spend so much time working on it that they never actually launch. And I've always been the opposite where I'll push out half baked things, wait for feedback and then keep going. And, <laughs> Dylan, who was a Submit Hub's employee, number one, he likes to call it launch and irritate. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's fine because it does work. I'll push these things out and, and literally within an hour, I get people saying, hey, this is broken or this doesn't work. And I know many businesses would roll their eyes and be like, dude, you can't push out a broken product like that and let your customers complain, but it works really well. So no, yeah, you have reactionary to have users testing kind of it. I, I, I agree. Like I, I always say like 70% perfect is perfect and 100% is failure because then you waited too long because there's always going to be something you have good, to yeah. change. Yeah, it changes. So I'm, 
I'm very quick to push out half-baked products and then develop them as they go and as I watch people interact with them. And that's that's been the process of Submit Hub for six years. So I'm still doing all the code. I'm still heavily involved with the customer support. And that just helps me get an idea of, oh, and I've read all the bad reviews. Woo, that one's always tough. Sometimes I go on Twitter. That's always negative. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm always in there. And, and I know a lot of people don't like seeing me show up. There's even some people out there who create memes of me and do all sorts of weird stuff. People are weird on the internet. Yeah. And that's fine. Fair game to them. But I am genuinely, uh, you know, it's, it's your... The best comparison I can make from an artist perspective is that when you send a song at Submit Hub and you get 50 people who tell you that they don't like your song for whatever random reason, it's a bummer. And I, I feel the same way when an artist comes back and they say, wow, that was a really bleak experience. You know, 50 people told me my song sucked. I won't be coming back. And, and <laughs> I, feel, I feel that same rejection right there. It's a very similar feeling. So in, in some ways I, I can... I can relate to these artists and, and my job ultimately is to say, cool, well, how can we get value from those 50 rejections? So we're, we're working out on that more this year is to try and figure out ways to, you're still going to get rejected, but at least to have it sort of come through the way you want it. Um, some people want you to be really nice and others want you to be really opinionated and, and critical about the song. So often I'll see people complain that the feedback's too vague or the feedback's not nice enough. And uh, it's one of those things where you can't please everyone. So I'm going to try please everyone <laughs> by capturing their preference beforehand. I, so I if think I can that ask makes you, a lot of sense. Yep, you're yeah. right, because some people just can't handle it. And some people really want the criticism. You know, I know for me, like my rating level is something like eight out of 10, because probably because I don't give enough information. But honestly, sometimes it's just like, you have a personal preference. Like, I just don't like this style. I don't like this song, whatever it is. And it's like my, yeah. you know, my podcast, I can choose, right? So sometimes it's like, there's nothing wrong with the structure of the song. There's nothing wrong with the production. I just didn't dig it, you know? It's, it can be difficult. And, and then you have to understand that the artist on the other side is going, that sounds like copy-pasted feedback and you're just taking my money. Mm -hmm. So it's a delicate balance. And, and we've, you know, it's one we learned about really early on. So a lot of it is expectation setting, um, telling artists up front what to expect. You're going to get rejected a lot and your feedback might be vague or it might be overly critical or this or that. Um, and, and so that expectation setting was something I had to learn early on because, you know, within the first few months, I, I was always nice with my feedback. But as I started letting on other bloggers, Occasionally, I get emails from artists going, you know, this is terrible. This is awful. Why would someone say that? I was, I was crying all night. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, God damn. What have I created? It's a monster. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, there is a thing on the curator side where, where like, we are told if you accept too high of a percentage of songs, that, like, reflects badly on you because it, you're being too easy. And so that's kind of a hard one on my side because it's like, well, I don't like to reject artists, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh look, we don't, we don't force a cap, but we do strongly discourage it because if you're sharing everything you get, it means you're not actually curating anymore. Right. That's right. And it also means that you're diluting your brand so much that the reality is people aren't going to come to you for recommendations of music anymore. So typically we do find that people who approve too much are, are bad news. Um, and we've definitely, I mean, this is another example of you know, building something that you think works and then people find a loophole. There was a group of Spotify playlisters, unrelated, didn't know each other, but multiple people figured out that just approving a song and using Submit Hub system to automatically put it in a playlist was less work than writing feedback. So they just started to approve everything. Yeah, so, so there, are, there are many reasons behind every decision and um not everyone likes all of them but we are we're, we're trying to solve for thousands of curators so yes uh, i would say anyone with a higher than 50 percent approval rate depending on how many songs they receive daily is probably not doing a good job of curating and is very likely to have an unengaged audience
Well, and I think the moral of the story about all of this is that you actually care about the artists and that's why you're trying to put all these systems into place. And as you said, they're not going to make everybody happy, but this is why I send people to submit hub because I know of seeing in the background, being a curator, like there's some like tight constraints on things. Like you have figured out how to close as many loopholes as possible in order to protect the artists. Right. So I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. We, look, we're trying. The reality is still that as an artist in 2022, it's next to impossible to, to break out. So you, you need to be careful going into Submit Hub and really understand what it is that you're trying to get out of it. Because if you go in hoping to break out or to get tens of thousands of plays, you're probably gonna walk away disappointed. There are many other reasons to use it and there are many reasons that people do, but uh, going in there, I've, I've had people come and say, cool, Hey, I want to get my song viral on TikTok. What do I do? I go, okay, well, the fact Pray that you're asking me this question. You. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the very fact that you're asking this question is a strong indicator that you're not going to go viral on TikTok. It's difficult. So so it is a, a, a large part of it is expectation setting. And we have to do that from our side. And then, yeah, we need to balance things. No, neither side is perfectly happy with the way it works, right? The curators would love to just listen to songs, get paid and not have to leave feedback. And the artists would love to just have everyone tell them that their song is awesome and get tons of fans. And, and trying to close that loop is difficult. <laughs> and I don't know if we ever will. Well, <laughs> we you're try. Getting as, you're getting as close as I've seen. So I must say, having yeah. worked on many platforms. Yeah, there, I mean, there are competitors who, who are coming up and who are trying similar things. And, uh, and I do see many of them stumbling through the same blocks that we've gone through. So, um, I mean, we reject about 80% of the Spotify playlists who apply to join Submit Hub because they look kind of sketchy. Mm. And then you'll go and you'll find those playlists on the other platforms. And um, yeah, it's six years. I, it's hard to catch up. I would say the closest one right now is going to be Groover. So they are a French, a former Submit Hub blogger who decided to create a French version of Submit Hub. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's evolved to much more than that. And then a couple months ago, they picked up seven million dollars of funding so they oh. are rapidly expanding their team but they're taking a very different approach to us in many ways so um we we are a team of of five and we're not planning on growing much we might hire another employee soon but i think Groover is pushing like 30 or 40 employees and they are a fraction of the size of submit hub so they're using that funding to to really grow their team and it's a, it's a very different approach I think when you're scaling like this, you got to use a little bit of auto magic and, and the code really steps in there and helps. So um, we've always been of the mindset that if there's a problem we keep bumping into or something we keep having to do, let's automate it through code. So I, that's actually what I do a lot of, of the time. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Now, I, I know that you are, I think you're, you said you're in South Africa. Like one thing I have learned mm. uh, from Submit Hub is like, you guys really have the international covered. Like a lot of other places I go, I'm mostly meeting people from the US, Canada. You guys, I've, I've met people from Sweden, the Netherlands, like, uh, you know, South Africa, like all over the world at Submit Hub that I would not have found on other sites. It is, well, so one thing that helps is that Submit Hub's available in 15 languages. So that helps a lot. Japanese, Russian, Spanish, French. Uh, much of it was translated by blogs themselves, but I've actually got a new translation system that I use these days, which is, uh, it uses Google Translate because Google Translate's just gotten really good over mm. the last three years. And um, it's funny, Groover's main argument is that they are Submit Hub, but with international curators. And I, I always find that a bit funny because <laughs> I think I think we're, we are... Uh, we are quite a diverse group on there. We've seen a lot of growth in South America and Russia, particularly on the influencer side. So uh, probably 50% of our influencers are made up of South America and Russia, which is a bit weird because most of our artists are coming from the US, the UK and, and Canada. So, but yeah, even, even on the artist side, I so saw our biggest country is the US and I think it's about 40% of users are from the US maybe just under 10% from the UK. It, it almost follows population sizes mm -hmm. in a weird way, definitely across the Western countries, at least. So, I mean, the US is five times as big as the UK. And so we have five times as many visitors from the US as we do the UK. Uh, I'm sure Groover has got a bigger presence in France because they are French. 
but but yeah it's it's been interesting how how diverse it is in in its representation of countries but there is still a lot of diversity lacking some of it is is made up i mean you're probably quite familiar with this but in large part most music bloggers historically have been men mm -hmm. and most spotify playlisters are men so so there is sort of a demographic breakdown there um where we have women on submit hub and actually indie shuffles majority female writers but it is a lot of the lone wolf spotify people are dudes so there's a lot more diversity to be had there but we've tried to steer clear of gender identification so a number of times i've had people ask me to can you please flag whether a curator is male or female or what their sexual orientation is and um i've steered clear of it for now i, I still think it should be more about the music and and what you like but there are you know there's some blogs out there that only focus on lgbtq plus right mm -hmm. so we need to make sure that that's notified but i haven't created a filter for it another one is religion comes up yeah. like where are all your christian bloggers tell me i only want to submit my music to christian bloggers and i'm like all right well here you go i did i did cave and i have a couple of religious genres but yeah yeah i know because i there is no way for me to like other than say in my <laughs> information like we play music by female artists female fronted bands that's it that's our yeah. platform and like there are plenty of people don't read i still get stuff from guys they don't. that's up to them if they want to lose their money yeah but yeah in my opinion if you're not willing to read like two lines to understand what the curator is about then you shouldn't be submitting to them anyway <laughs> i i would agree it's a difficult one to solve right actually yours is an interesting one because one thing we've done recently on the influencer side is we noticed that a lot of people would land on there, <laughs> get faced with a list of a thousand influencers, and you don't really know who to click on or what they are or what the point is, right? Just tell mm -hmm. me who I should send to. So in December, we rolled out something called a budget submission where on the influencer side, you can just set your budget. Let's say you want to spend a hundred credits. You set your targeting. I want to do TikTok videos from the US uh, and I want to spend an average of five to 10 credits per share. Boom. And then we take care of the rest in terms of deciding who that gets sent to. Mm. So it's, it's, it's one of these auto magic things, but you just set your budget and we keep filling it until it hits your budget. And that's actually worked out quite well. Um, it's, it's needed a bit of tweaking over time, but we are now debating whether we should do something similar on the curator side. So for people who don't want to scroll through an endless list of, you know, a thousand Spotify playlists, and they just want to say, I've got an indie rock song. Here it is. Here's, here's 200 credits and I got other stuff to do. And, and your case is actually going to be an interesting one to solve for because I, I, don't, I don't ask artists if they're male or female. And so when you set a budget one, I, I'm going to have to, oh Lord, I'd probably have to exclude you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just thinking out loud. It's one of the only ways to really solve it without asking you, do you only want female acts and asking them, are you female? And then, I mean, how do you act if it's uh, like two females and two males in the band? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, you get a little splitting hairs, but for me, it's like yeah. if the female is the primary vocalist right. or, you know, most featured or okay. whatever. Yeah, we have some songs where the woman is the singer and then there's like a guy rapping occasionally and that's still fine. Okay, so that's, still, see, it's, yeah, anyway, these budget submissions, they'll be difficult. Um, right. But what <laughs> we found on the influencer side is... <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's about 50-50 on the influencer side, but I think in a case like yours, I would have to, oh man, you made me, you made me think of something I didn't think of. I think in general, I'm just going to have to, we're going to have to take a dump of all of our curators and read every single one of their bios to try and figure out what the corner cases are that we, because I don't want to send you a bunch of songs you don't like. There, yeah. Now you've just got some inside, inside perception into the stuff <laughs> that goes it. on in my Cody head. Um, that project it. will probably happen in the second half of this year. But I'm yeah. guessing that budget option will be really good for um, like promoters that submit their artists because I do see that plenty of PR people are doing this submitting for artists. Yep. And they can. I think it like, will be here, useful for that. But budget. I I would say that on average, we feel internally we can do a better job of creating campaigns than a new artist can. So when you're a new artist and you join Submit Hub, it can be a bit daunting. There is an overwhelming amount of information and figuring out who to submit to can be a little difficult. 
So part of our thinking here is that with these budget ones, we can, we can implement some of our own strategies that we think work to try and maximize the results that people get from it. You know, one strategy we have, again, there might, there's artists listening, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a strategy. Um, when you're choosing people to submit to, it's often good to sort of split them up into tiers of how generous they are with their approvals. So we would typically say, if you're going to send to 20 people, maybe focus 10 to 15 of them in that range of um, a 15 to 30% approval rate. So what that means is that on those 10 to 15, your odds of getting approved are going to be pretty decent and you're actually going to get some coverage. Save a small portion of your credits for the long shots, the indie shuffles, the hype machine blogs, the guys who get so many submissions every day that they only pick one or two of. One of the big mistakes we would see is a new artist comes on, they get, you know, the right shining lights and oh, there's Stereo Fox and Ear Milk and Alex Rainbow music and they, and they go for all these guys and they don't pay attention to the fact that they each have an average approval rate of 2%. And so what they end up doing is they send to 20 curators, all of them with an average percent below 5%. And the odds of being rejected by all 20 of them is, is really high. So that's an example of something we would do with these budget submissions is we would kind of spread it out a little bit so that you do get some coverage from small ones. It's not going to move the needle as much, but we'll also throw some long shots in there. It's kind of, it's kind of like betting on horses. Playing the or odds. Yes. <laughs> that's what I was You're right. You got that one horse. It's going to pay out really well, but they're just uh, probably not going to win. Uh, and so you do a couple of those, but then you, you kind of bet, bet your money on the safe one as well. It's uh, honestly so like we, a money investing strategy, right? Yeah. So, so we do find artists do that. And, and oftentimes when I get these customer complaints about how terrible Submit Hub is, I observe that the people they chose to send to were the pickiest ones they could have. And you kind of go, well, no, duh. So anyway, that, that's the type of stuff that I think will be useful. So it's not just about uh, industry specific people, but I think for the average artist um, who doesn't have all day to sit on here and sift through each curator and find out what the match is, I think we can actually do a pretty decent job algorithmically. So that's very cool. That's I, I think that'll be awesome when that rolls out. So, wow, we've covered a ton today. Uh, this has been so great. I've actually been thinking about asking you to come on here for a while. So I'm glad I reached out My once pleasure. I kind of got back on some MitHub after a while and uh, reminded me how really how good the artists are that I hear on some MitHub. So I've, I'm very impressed with the quality. Um, yeah. Let them know how they can find you uh, if they want to, you know, say good things or bad things on Twitter or wherever you guys are, <laughs> as well as submithub.com where you guys yeah. can sign up. You can email me at jason at submithub.com. And if you've made it this far into the podcast, <laughs> um first thank you and secondly if you shoot me an email and you let me know what your username is maybe i'll send you some credits too Ooh, yeah. i like that that's awesome okay you guys submithub.com check it out um we are on there women of substance as well uh, we don't take submissions all the time um on there we only do when we have space because we get direct submissions as well. So some, you know, you might go there and we're not taking submissions and it says we're not. Then they can, um, if they see that you're not taking submissions, there will be a button for them to click to get a reminder oh, or notification I didn't even know when you, you had come back that. online. Yeah. The mart. Cause yeah, I open them up when I have a few spots left in the podcast. So like I did that yeah. this last weekend and then I shut it down like after about 36 hours. So. Okay, that's a it's a decent window, but basically what that means is that when you reactivate, we send out emails to to people who have been waiting for you to come back, mm. and I guess they have thirty six hours to jump on and send to you. So yeah, it depends on how many spots know. I have left, and you know, I think it was the weekend too, so I was just like, let me just fill a few spots, <laughs> and that's what's nice for me as a curator because I know I can go there and find some really good quality stuff when I need it. Yeah, there's also the popular list you could jump into. I don't know if you've done that as well. I have occasionally. Yeah, it's it's nice because you know that that stuff has already kind of been sifted through. Yeah, and uh, we pay you out of our pocket if you find a song you like. That's so. awesome. Well, I'll have to check that yeah. out next time for sure when I need some stuff. So you guys go to submithub.com, check it out, email Jason, get your credits. Thanks so much for listening. And thank you, Jason, for all the info and being super My honest pleasure. about everything too. <laughs> that's the way we roll thanks for listening to the profitable musician show 
I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.